Welcome, welcome. I love that Jill Mokes entry. Welcome everybody to Stone Fruit Roll Up. This is your weekly Thursday live show all about anything and everything. You are watching the show about building the show that you're watching right now. This is our adventure of hosting uh, a live show and experimenting with content and figuring it out as we go along. And that's why I am unbelievably excited to join in conversation with our very special guest today, Jennifer Thornton from 304 Coaching. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jennifer, but first I'm going to tell you why I really need to tap into her business brilliance today. And that is that when you are creating a, and a show like this or a project that's amplifying your business efforts and putting you out there and getting you visibility, which is the point of the whole dang thing, there are a lot of moving parts. It's like herding kittens. You can only imagine from the project management standpoint, all the different things that have to be taken care of to execute a live show week after week after week. And I'm not sharing that with you because I want you to be impressed. Although, you know, I am sharing this with you because dang, this is the part where you need a team. There is no better team builder I've ever seen in my five decades of watching people um, create work environments and lead teams like my near and dear client, Jennifer Thornton, who is our guest here today. She has this uncanny ability to create a magnifying centrifugal force of creativity and innovation and curiosity amongst a group of high-performing professionals who are scattered all over the country. And I want to know how she does it. Um, and I want to follow in her disruptor style. So I am so excited. Jill is here in the comments coming in from merry old England. I think she just likes to hear me say, welcome, welcome in her voice. So uh, without further ado, as we pop off here in the comments, I'm going to ask our executive producer and intergalactic intern Saturn Gunter to bring JT to the screen. Welcome, JT. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having me today. <laughs> oh my God, girl. I am so excited. Here's why. I've never seen anybody be able to rally a uh, like a performance level gold standard team like you have and do it without any fear based language with a healthy culture with a collaborative environment. I'm so excited to be part of your team. And I can't wait to learn like what's your secret sauce and how you do the thing. But first, let's tell the folks like how you come about those credit, how you came about this chops. How'd you get these chops, girl? Are your credibility? You are um, an executive uh, coach. You are a consultant. You help large, like big name. I don't know how many of those names you might want to drop. Uh, clients with on an individual basis, and then also um, from a country company wide talent strategy perspective, build the kind of teams that can deliver on any business vision or goal. Um, you've been doing that under your own shingle for the last five years. Tell us a little bit about how, um, how you decided to do it differently. I'd love to hear your story about how you are disrupting leadership and the way we've always done it. Oh, so where to start? So um, I think where to start is just very early on, you know, my dream in life, because we all have dreams, was to work in the mall. And um, I had big we dreams. Too. Yeah. I wanted to work at the mall. I mean, who didn't? Um, as I like to age myself and say, you know, I worked at the mall before the internet. So this is when you actually like helped people. And I mean, it was like, if, if you, 
didn't have what they wanted. You found something else. There was no like getting on the internet and just ordering it for them. You had to sell something else to them. So I love the energy. I love the people. Um, what I didn't know at that time when I was young is that I was learning leadership really early in life. If you're running a store, you know, sometimes when we walk in to a restaurant or into um, a mall store, any of those type of services, what we don't realize is those people are leading multi-million dollar businesses and they are making decisions in the moment all day, every day. And so from a very early age, I had to learn how to hire people, how to schedule, how to deal with conflict, how to give feedback, um, because we had to make our numbers every night too. We had to make sure all of those KPIs were being hit. You know, I was probably one of the only people in high school that understood what KPIs were and how to pull different levers to make all those numbers come together. Um, and that's the first question I want to ask you. How old, when you say very young, how old were you the first time you were like writing a schedule or mm -hmm. just like having to train somebody? What were no. you like six, 16, 17? Probably not that young. Definitely working, um, you know, that young. I probably got, you know, as we would say back in the days, keys to the store um, <laughs> where yeah. I had to do all of that. Um, gosh, I was, I was a, I think it was the summer before my senior year. So yeah, I'd probably been 17. Wasn't necessarily doing schedules, but I was responsible for making sure we closed everything out at night, made our numbers, all the, like all of those things. Gosh, it's crazy. That probably wouldn't happen in today's world. But yeah, I was probably too young to have that responsibility, but hey, why not? I don't know. People, <laughs> you know, entrepreneur, like people are hiring their kids to run their social media platform you once you start scooping ice cream suddenly you know you have the keys to the store too it seems like if you see someone who is just kind of taking responsibility and entrepreneurially spirited you just start giving them a chance and that's how we build our careers uh working in malso for real um Building Tony's coming in age. <laughs> exactly. Tony's coming in the comments and wants to know what your favorite mall uh, treats are. Mine were Orange Julius. Oh my god, I was going to say Orange Julius for sure. Um, but I'll never forget when Auntie Anne's came online and girl, that mall smelled so good and all that <laughs> cinnamon and sugar and yeah. So I did love me some Auntie Anne's pretzels when they first started opening. I remember our first one at the mall I was at. It was a big deal. I'm not going to lie. Day. I got one two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> I still want <laughs> one in our mall here. And I'm like, oh, it takes me back to the day because it smells so good. <laughs> I know. That's how I feel with Orange Julius. I worked in a one hour photo. So talk about things you don't do anymore. Yeah. No. I'm <laughs> printing those out. Okay. Awesome. So. Um, taking us back to these early days in your retail and then climbing your way in that corporate ladder of a very traditional job trajectory. When did you start to notice that maybe leadership needs needed some fixing, as we say? Yeah. So I'll never forget um, when um, a peer of mine got a job that I thought that I would have been great for. And um, it was, you know, later on my career and it was like a crossroads for me. It was, you know, some of those best gifts are things that we don't get. And that was a best <laughs> gift for me <laughs> that I did not get. And what I started, and at the time when I was not happy at all about this, my supervisor said, there's something else. There's something else I think you'd be better at. And I was like, well, what is that? She's like, I'm not ready to tell you. So of course I'm like so mad, so frustrated. I'm sure in my mind said and did horrible things in my mind. But um, what I was realizing and what my incredible leader at the time was realizing is that I wasn't, I didn't lead the way other people led which had made me successful to a point, but wasn't gonna make me successful in that next level. So I am not a competitive person, I'm just not. And I love to be number one and I love to be the best and I love to win, all of that is true, but I don't do it just because I can do it. I do it because I think it's fun to do that with a team of people and it's great to create something with people. And so, in the land of operations where you're chasing numbers, you know, I had to really be more of a, just a kind of a, 
a KPI, have to hit this. And I leaned more towards let's rally this group, let's build a team. And oh, by the way, we also were number one too. And so I just came at it from a different direction. And so what that leader was you know, leading me towards was moving my career from an operation standpoint to HR, which is what I did midstream in that time period of my career is I, you know, went to a completely different side of the business because it was just naturally what I did well was thinking about recruitment, hiring the right people, making the right people work together. How do you curate a group of people that are different, but yet really enjoy each other? And that tied it up in HR. And um, I was a little bit of a disruptor in that area too, because I wasn't classically trained. So I wasn't a policy police girl. I wasn't like, well, you know, the law says that, it, and I'm like, well, let's just see what we could do within the, you know, kind of the borders I was given. And so I always thought about how do we drive the business through the people? And with that combination of some HR experience and operations, I kind of created this odd piece that I am and why I look at things a little differently. Odd piece that you are is the piece that I love. <laughs> I love how you think. And um, you've, you've taught me, uh, you know, you've taught me so you really have taught me so much about how to talk to people, how to engage with other team members. Um, you have a really strong neuroscience background and you're really passionate about going into human behavior and skill building and you're never ceaselessly educating yourself on what makes us better as humans so that we can be better as humans at work. And I'd love to show the folks at home what I'm talking about. So I have a little show and tell. Are you up for it? I think so. This is a surprise. So I'm um, anxiously awaiting I'm what the surprise might be. I promise there's nothing you haven't seen here before. So okay. uh, we're going to do a little slideshow. I just, the point of the show is to show you how I've experienced your leadership on the team and what my journey was like to be a part of this. And then I want to come back around in the back end of that show and just deconstruct your perspective of this and teachable moments for other folks who really want to build a team that is, as you said, based in performance rather than competition, or as Jillian and I like to say, collaboration over competition. So I put together a little side show to tell my story of you and me and our, our, our whirlwind romance. When we started working together, um, it had been pretty much a few years in between our first project and then the next thing we did. So I came on board in the summer and you brought me on board to uh, write emails for 304 Coaching to keep your email list going. I encourage everyone to visit 304coaching.com and get on that mailing list because these emails are chef's kiss if I do say so myself. And then about six months into that project, you and I had only worked solo, one-on-one, -on -one, just client on client, a very normal kind of copywriter or consultant and client relationship. And then you invited me to join you and Team 304 in Texas, where you live, and have a train retreat. And we didn't know each other at all. And I thought that this was a really, a really interesting way to storytell your leadership style without just talking about it. So let's do a show and tell. Saturn, can you advance easily? Okay, all right, that's right. We're not from Texas. Everyone, um, with the exception of Jody, was really scattered kind of across the country. So we didn't share a geographical bond. We hadn't had a lot of time together to work as a team. And then all of a sudden we're thrown into this really intimate environment. But um, it was probably the most powerful team building experience that I've ever had. And I've been through nonprofit retreats and, you know, conferences, et cetera, because you really brought us together to get to know each other in a powerful way. So you took us to your house that you're building and we got to see the framework of all that. I mean, these are people who did not know each other the day before. 
Um, and then we drove on up to the Eagle of the Canyons, which was an incredible resort um, right in Hill Country, where my grandmother, near where my grandmother is from. And we started to work together in a workshop style environment. We had um, a little bit of team building exercises, but we did business planning and we worked on projects and we planned um, an initiative. And then you did this really amazing thing where you asked each one of us to put forth a presentation to showcase our skills and our talents. This piece here is so important because this is the place where all of us learned what the other person is good at. And as far as I've been working for you, you've never asked us to not do the things that we're really good at. So here, Jody showed us how to create a really awesome, uh, a really awesome slide presentation. And Krista was showing us her game, which was really, really cool. I'll pause here for a second and see if you want to respond to this piece, JT, about how you asked why you asked us to um, to do this piece. What? How were you motivated? How was this creating a team for you? This was so fun. I learned so much. This is like, you know, I think always when we do something, um, you know, you look back at these moments where you're like, that moment was, you know, like a leapfrog moment. Like we all leapt together during this moment. And what I wanted to do here is, you know, all of you were, you know, no one knew each other. I knew all of you individually and I knew everyone had so much they were bringing to the table, but none of you knew what the other person was great at. And I didn't fully know. And so the goal here was, you know, tell us what you're really freaking awesome at and just show us. And so um, everyone did that. It was so cool. We learned so many things and we learned about each other and laughed. We did a ton of laughing during this um, exercise, but we got to really understand each other for what we're amazing at instead of oh, those horrible. They just make me crazy. What are you good at? What do you want to work on? <laughs> like all that stuff. We just were like, here's where we're awesome. And I'd like to be more awesome where I'm awesome. And how do I do more of what I'm really great at? And that was the goal of this. And that is always the goal when I work in assembled teams is bringing in people who have unique talents that no one else has and keeping them in their zone of genius, keeping them doing what they do, which is why we have, you know, a bigger team that are all um, entrepreneurs in their own right, instead of like two generalists who try to do everything that just isn't doesn't work for me. I like people to show up every day and be just fantastic. And, you know, from a neuroscience standpoint, this brings all those good chemicals, right? So when we're talking about what we're proud of, what we're good at, what we do, our brain releases incredible, like happy hormones, which create this opportunity for us to hear things and see things and understand each other. And it creates an emotional and chemical connection. And um, this was so fun. Like I, um, I'm glad that this was as fun for you as it was for me and that you bring it up here today. And a lot of these ideas we still used to, or we started using. So Krista in the yellow there, she was showing all these games she had made and it sparked all these ideas for me. And we've been making um, all different types of actual games, not only for our own workshops, the workshops we host at 304, but also for clients. So we've been making all of these custom design games for organizations to use to help teach culture, values, those types of things. But that idea came from this along with a million other ideas that came from this experience. And I'll say the thing that was so remarkable about this for me now in retrospect is that there isn't a shadow of a doubt who does what and does what excellently on the team. I don't live in ambiguity of like, well, you know, we need a presentation, but I'm not really sure who does that piece. And there's, you see, I think we spend a lot of time kind of in, conf when you're on a team, in confusion of to whose roles and responsible. When they say stay in your lane, what does that actually mean? But by doing this and not presenting it as like, I specialize in blah, 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 which you'll never remember. This show and tell solidified, you know, again, everyone's zones of genius. 
I think it also should be noted because it's so powerful, JT, is that you don't ask anyone to work outside of this. I don't have to um, write emails and then do the part I can't stand, which is to load it into the software and schedule it. Like I, my, I just don't, that's not a place I enjoy spending my time. And you've never once asked me to do that. You have an admin person who really likes the mechanics of all that. So because you've been able to coordinate us in a communication circle where we know each other and trust each other, I don't have to be the one who owns the entire workflow. Can you speak a little to that? Yeah, that's again, allows us to do what we're really good at. And every piece of your business, there is someone out there that is good at it and wants to do it. You just have to take the time to look for it. And it's small things that make the difference. And so, for example, you know, if Rebecca writes copy, Rebecca isn't, re you know, she does it and looks at it. And I mean, you never send me anything that's like not put together. But then we have Chelsea on our team who has this magic eye as an editor. I don't know what kind of superpower she was given at her birth, but that woman can edit like no one's business. And she reads those emails and she'll read them with a fresh eye because you and I do them and we're like, oh, this sounds great. And she's like, this makes no sense. <laughs> and it's so, not even a sentence. <laughs> we're like, oh, thanks. Um, and so she reads them with a fresh eye, just like someone on our email list would. She gives us feedback. And sometimes she's like, oh, I love this. Great job. Or she's like, oh, this is not Or she'll ask sense. a question or she'll say, I learned something today, which is actually very cool to see come to yeah. life and then she edits it and then she's very techy and she enjoys the tech technology piece of it she edits she gives us feedback she gets questions answered and then she loads it into the system and off it goes and so it allows you know you to do what you do best create copy it allows her to do what she does best with this fresh eye and mind and then use her technical skills and it all comes together and knock on wood we haven't missed a email yet we haven't missed an email yet and also it doesn't tie up my bandwidth to have something that's been like publishing ready i mean i really don't require a lot of edits in general but knowing that there's someone else has their eye on that frees me up to then you know position the, a new podcast or create a list building campaign or to meet with you for strategy because I'm not bogged down in all my time, you know, proofing things or hiring a proofer. Um, and it just like creates this beautiful ecosystem. Yeah. You said, you said something so interesting, which I just am fascinated with is I don't hire generalists. I bring in specialists who are entrepreneurs in their own right, and we all work together simpatico. This is where I think your disruptive team building creates an environment for innovation, resilience, and creativity, but it's a big lift. Like you, ha you can't just like put an ad out and just like hire the next marketing person fresh out of college. You've got to really curate who your people are and this speaks to your talent with talent strategy. Yeah. Tell us more about that, JT. Yeah. So I think that, you know, in a small business, you can hire a few people that wear a lot of hats and you will be disappointed in them and they will be disappointed in their own performance, you know, 50% of the time. Because if you're two job, two job descriptions into one job, chances are you can't hire two people in one body. You got to hire someone who's good at one or the other and they'll hobble through the other part until your business has grown enough to hire someone to take that or until they get sick of not doing stuff they don't want to do and they find a new job. And so it's just how it works. And I think we've all been in those positions where we um, were doing jobs that we didn't like, we weren't good at it and we just, oh, like it just hurts. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted everyone to be really awesome. And so that's what we've done. We've hired experts and um, and I've brought, you know, especially this trip, it was about bringing all these experts together because not only do I want to have a great organization and, you know, people love the work we produce because, gosh, we have like the most brilliant minds that come together to produce the work that we do. 
but I also wanted to champion, champion your own success. And I think that's what leaders in corporate America don't understand that they have the opportunity to do is every single person on the team, I want them to be as successful as they ever dreamed they might be. And to do that, I have to champion them. I have to say, hey, if you want this, here's someone over here. And after this, you know, kind of this fun weekend trip we took, the thing that brought me the most joy is that some of you started to work on your own projects outside of 304 together. And that was like, just made me so happy that Full circle. this moment allowed you to grow who you wanted to be and who you wanted to be for your career, um, which I think is just amazing. But too often leaders are too worried about their own success to champion the success of others. And I know the more um, successful each of you are, the more you're going to want to work and do great things for 304. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, like this. Oh, and oh, my heart. Yeah, yeah I know. It's a cool story. This is a very cool story. And it speaks to one, you highlighting and championing people's work. It speaks to this kind of collaboration in a kind of client work that is so recognized and seen. And girl, I don't need to tell you about retention. Like, this is the most loyal team member you're ever going to have because this is how you make her feel. Tell us the story. So one of our incredible clients is the Natural Diamond Council, and they are a beautiful um, organization that promotes um, the sale of natural diamonds, but really promotes the sustainability and how diamonds give back and and the org the countries that were you know there are children getting free education free health care anyhow i could go on and on but we um per we are their education vendor so we create all of their education and Anne um is incredible her superpower is creating education inside of um articulate 360 which is a very specific software i don't even know how to like turn the software on like I don't even know how to do it. She is so good at it. And so the Natural Diamond Council, um, after we did our first round of education, delivered it to them. Um, they sent a gift to both myself and to Anne. And it was this beautiful, huge coffee table book. In fact, I have mine right here. My gift is right, ah! right here. And um, but also sent her one. And I think the thing I loved about this is, you know, I'm very clear that it's not just me, that there are a whole bunch of us incredibly talented people pulling this together. And I use your names and talk about your names. And so Anne got the gift. And this is Anne being um, Anne and her big heart and teary after getting a gift from our client. And you made her feel so seen like that. I, I didn't know her at all. And this was something that deeply impacted everybody. So excellent, excellent segue. <clears throat> and then, you know, we all kind of sat down and got to work, JT. How, what was your experience like leading, you know, a room of eight people and this cat, <laughs> whatever cat that is, leading a room of eight people yeah. that didn't, hadn't worked together before? Did you feel like the work actually got done? Yeah, I think the work got done. And I think for me, what the work was, was bringing the team together, helping you bond, helping you think about how you wanted to come together, sharing ideas, building something bigger than any of us could have built individually with our own ideas. And there wasn't like a big like, we must accomplish these four things or this has failed. It was something you can't necessarily put on a checklist. For me, this was really about the personal connections of building a team and bringing a team together. And that's why these moments are so important. And, you know, when these moments become overly curated, they, um, they lose that connection. And the emotions of an experience is what creates the memories of the experience. Um, so that's what, you know, I wanted to do. And um, obviously from our conversation today, I created the emotions of the memories, which creates the results. We sure did. Oh, look, look at, at you and Jen. Yeah, man. Look at how cute we are. Oops, we're there twice. We're there, it's a nice note twice. Sorry, JT, Blonde's have more fun. <laughs> It did actually create an emotional connection between us. And before anyone kind of out there in the studio audience thinks, well, yeah, of course, you, you know, take them to a fancy retreat in the middle of hill country. And then, you know, you 
make them cry and you create all these wonderful experiences and you provide can, wine and provide wine. <laughs> I don't have, a, I don't have a wine picture, but we're getting, we're getting more exciting as we go on. Um, so there was a lot of work and then there was a lot of play for those of us who were lucky enough to stick around. You gave us the, you know, a memory of a lifetime to see uh, your, your, your delightful cousin and his talented band that people may have heard of, like, really big deal called Lone Star and here we all are like backstage on the tour bus like you just included everybody and it was just such a wonderful bonding experience here's our selfie on the tour bus I've never been on a tour bus before yeah. and as you know I'd never heard of this band before and now I'm a huge fan they rocked it they absolutely killed it mm -hmm. To your point earlier in the broadcast about like how now we're, you know, collaborating together on our own projects. Here's just two examples. Jody's coming on this show mm -hmm. to show us how to do a slide makeover. If she's watching this one, she's probably cringing at this slide presentation right now. Mm -hmm. um, but it has had such a, I mean, this is, this is literally 18 months later that people are coming together, that Jody and I are doing an independent project and coming together. So... We are coming to the end of my slide presentation, so I don't want to keep this on too long, but I do want to encourage folks at home to please visit 304coaching at 304.com to get into this delicious podcast, Let's Fix Leadership, where the topics are fire uh, and really does say the quiet part out loud about how we lead teams and also to connect with you on LinkedIn. So that's, those are your, those are your promos unless anything else you want to throw out there. No, that's great. Thank you for that. Uh, you're absolutely, absolutely welcome. So JT, now that we've kind of walked through our experience on that retreat and we've talked about how you've built this team, I'd love for some kind of how to coaching. Cause again, this is the show about the sh building the show that you're watching right now. I, am a disaster starting this team out. I have a pretty strong ability to, you know, charisma my way around engaging people with my projects and people genuinely really like working with me, but I get very, very stuck in like, well, if I haven't planned it out way in advance, then I'm just going to put out that fire. And then what happens is I have a team that's like kind of disjointed and I'm not really leading. I'm just doing the things and then I'm not really growing. So girl, help a sister out. How would you advise people who have been solopreneurs for 20 years and now have to activate some sort of team building because they're growing? Question mark. Oh. Where to start? So I think the first thing to do is really get clear on what things would elevate your business. And, and I think that's what happens. Like someone's in their business, they may be overwhelmed. They know they need help, they, but they don't know what to do or like they, they don't know where to start. And so they just throw something out there or they meet someone's cousin's brother's sister's uncle. And they're like, Oh yeah, you'll do. And they don't really put the thought into what the team, each person would be doing. Why would they be doing it? How do, how does that intersect? And I think that's really the first work is really deciding um, the, t the skills that you need to onboard because that will lead you to the person you need to hire. And um, it's not the glamorous part of the work, but it's the work that matters. And are we you, pushing? Sorry, go JT. I, no, go ahead. I was going to ask you, are we pushing back on the idea of hiring for culture? I think you can do both in some ways. Say more about that. So I can hire someone that is an amazing culture fit, but if they can't do the work they were hired to do, they're not going to be happy. They might enjoy working with the two of us and everyone else on the team. And they, but they're like, every day I feel like a failure. Like you, like you have to think about both things. Um, are there positions where you can hire someone from a culture and develop and train them? Absolutely. Those, those types of situations too. But, you know, in this kind of mind, like we'll kind of think about it as you're hiring someone that's maybe mid to somewhere else in their career, you know, mid and on up, you know, you're hiring someone who's a culture fit, but also someone who can bring the skills to 
the conversation. And it's not only about what we do, but it's how we do it. And so I just like I can hire someone who may be the best at whatever I've hired them to do, but they're disruptive, they're rude, they don't gel with the team, they make a team who's always gotten along so well start to fracture. Well, that can't happen either. And so it's a it's a fine balance between finding someone who has the skills that you need to hire and will work in a way in which elevates the team versus decreasing the team um, alignment. This reminds me of your idea or your concept that you call the talent cliff. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is on the reverse end of how do I get started mm -hmm. and really ask what happens if I don't do that? What happens if I just keep plugging along, you know, in my own putting out fire solopreneur style and I never really rally any kind of a team from my a small business perspective. And then I'd love to see you kind of blow out the, you know, kind of open up the aperture a little bit and talk about companies that have like 400 employees or 500 employees. What happens if you don't create uh, a, a create this environment of curiosity and collaboration and you just kind of work in a silo? So in most organizations, the goal is to grow most org in, and that's, you know, kind of where most people are, especially as a solo entrepreneur, you're growing your business. Um, some people are at where they want to be and that's great. And that's kind of a different strategy. The talent cliff really speaks to companies who are growing and trying to scale. And what happens is the company gets that momentum because the right people are in the right seats and everyone's doing great things and their skill is a little bit higher than what they actually do. And so you're able to grow into that space, right? That white space between skill and need. Your, your company is growing into that. And what happens is individuals start to focus on the widget. They focus on um, transportation. They like whatever they this, this stuff. And they don't put the same amount of attention into the team. But then what happens is if your team is not growing faster than your business is growing, and I mean intellectually and skill and competency wise, then what will happen is eventually the business will catch up to their skill set. And then there's a wall or the worst situations is when the business kind of out succeeds what that team can do. And all of a sudden the, the business starts to go south. And in those situations, if you're not investing as much into your team as you are investing into growing your, your service model or your widget, then you'll hit the talent cliff and your best people will be your first to go because they're not gonna wanna be around for the ship. Like they're like, oh, there's cracks in the ship. I'm finding a new one. And so your best people go first. Then the next people start trying to row and they were already over taxed and max. So now they're really maxed. And so all of a sudden everyone's kind of going off that cliff. Um, and then right behind it is your business. <laughs> right behind. I love the way your voice trailed off. Like that was a, like that was a fairy tale. Have yeah. you ever seen a situation where that happened and the business outgrew the founder? Oh yeah. The business outgrows the, the founder all the time and it's heartbreaking. Um, it's also just as heartbreaking when someone um, like helped like start the company. They were employee number one or two, and then the business outgrows them. And everyone's like, what do we do with them? He's great. We love him. Uh, like, right. And they do really mean things like just put him in the corner. And, you know, and that's, I think, some of the cruelest things you can do. Um, and so that all does happen, um, happens all the time. Again, it's heartbreaking. So um, in those situations, you know, as as a founder, as um, a leader, you have to know, again, where you're really good. And at some point at times, a founder needs to step aside to continue to do what makes them great, continue to do their best work and hire someone whose best work is leading the organization. And, you know, we see that out there, um, you know, gosh, um, Jeff Bezos, he left Amazon. He's like, I maxed out. I don't think. I have much left to give. And he left as a CEO, you know, left and to do other projects, but found a great replacement and has someone else leading the company he founded. And, um, you know, there's stories like that all over the place. But as a leader, 
stepping aside and staying in your zone. Like when you grow a business, it's like, I can do this and I'm trying this. And then all of a sudden it just keeps growing, but the amount that you're not loving grows too. And so you've got to kind of clean that up, go do what you're good at and hire someone to do the stuff that you're just not meant to do. And that's okay. And that's okay. But that takes a lot of guts to make a decision like that, which pivots us into the top. My favorite thing that you talk about, which I think is the way you are the most disruptive, is your the your absolute assertion that fuck fear. Like <laughs> yeah, fear, yeah. <laughs> fear is a thing that is ruining everything. And fear-based language is a you know is a strong demotivator and you have all the neuroscience behind that fear of being irrelevant or no longer needed i'm sure keeps founders from leaving when they've the business has outpaced them let's get into fear because this has influenced almost every aspect of my professional development is understanding how fear works in the brain and i talk about it all the time if you've seen even more than one episode of this show you've heard me talk about fear and how it's mutually exclusive with innovation so or let's get into it about fear. Let's how did you it. first how did you first see it like its toxic fingers take a choke hold in a previously healthy business scenario? So it happens when um, leaders get a little wobbly. You know, I would say you were getting a little wobbly here. You know, we're, <laughs> we're getting outside of our zone of genius. We're doing stuff we're not good at. We're getting a little wobbly. Let's let's upright. Let's get back to where we're good. So, you know, fear is an interesting thing. It is just a chemical reaction. We all have it. You cannot stop it, but you can learn to recognize and manage it. It's how we stay alive. If we didn't have some sort of fear mechanism, we would be jumping off buildings. We'd be thinking we could fly. Like we'd be doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Like thank goodness that we have fear in our bodies. Um, but because it's just a chemical reaction, um, your body doesn't always understand, you know, the difference between getting in trouble during a presentation and, um, you know, a snake on your leg or something crazy like that. Like, it's just all fear. What a Texas analogy. I know, right? A, a rattlesnake, rattlesnake cleaning up your boot. That's right. It's just rattlesnake. It's fine. There's <laughs> anti-venom for that. It's fine. Um so anyhow, that fear comes and starts to mess with us. And the higher our fear gets, the less control in that moment we have of our emotions, um, the less innovation, it shuts down learning, it shuts down our ability to hear. And it really is, you know, the higher the fear, the lower everything you want happening. I mean, it just you just turn it off. And I watch people do it day after day after day. And um, it's sad and it's um, it's tough and it's what kills businesses. It's fear. And, you know, if the business gets a little bumpy, you know, then the leaders get a little cranky and then all of a sudden it's everyone else's problem. And then all of a sudden everyone's in fear and no one can figure out how to fix a business because everyone's running around in fear. So they don't have access to the parts of their brain that could actually fix the business. And, um, you know, even as a business owner, you know, some months and years are better than others. And I have to not respond to the fear of that. I have to say, well, you know, this quarter has been quiet, but every other quarter has been great. There's a good chance next quarter is going to be great because what that does is it allows me to stay in creativity. It allows me to say, okay, then what's next? If I'm not in fear of the business, then I have the capacity to think about what is next and actually do things that drive the business versus like, you know, hide and shake in the corner and do nothing. Um, so fear is just, I mean, we could do a four hour show on fear. And we could do a four hour show on fear for sure. Zach is in the Ooh. comments. I'm super excited. Zach is here because he's, he's a born team leader and he's, yeah. he's a very, um, it's very innovative in the way that he approaches things. So like, I'm super excited for him to learn from you today. And his question is, in your opinion, which is more powerful, the fear of losing or the love of winning? What a masculine question. Oh, it is. I love someone who makes me think. So thank you for making me think. Um, I think what is more powerful is fear. Um, because, you know, we can't love winning if we're in fear that the next time we'll lose. 
and we can't enjoy the moment if our fear is like, oh, well, how in the world am I going to top this? Or, you know, oh my gosh, everyone's going to think I'm going to perform this way every day. And so fear can take away the love of winning. So fear, um, unfortunately, my viewpoint, fear trumps everything and what is most powerful. And that's why the importance of managing it is just everything. Let's ask, let's ask the question is, uh, well, first of all, I'll say that Jill chimes in that um, fear crushes creativity. We'll get that up there, which I agree. Let's ask the real question though, JT. What are we all, what are we afraid of? What is, what is the fear? What are we afraid of? I think that's different for everybody. Everyone has their own fear. I mean, if you go back and really think about it from a science perspective or from you know evolution perspective, um, we were in fear of being alone um, because we really would die alone. I mean, we lived in tribes. You know, we worked in groups. Um, you know, we you know that's, we have family nucleus, nucleuses today. Though in today's world, because we have things like you know Grubhub and Amazon delivery, we don't have to live and with multiple people in one household. Um, because back in the day, you needed everyone to participate. Everything was a team. You stayed alive for the team. If you were kicked out of your tribe, you couldn't provide shelter, find water, food, harvest. Like it would have been very hard to do all of that as a single individual. And so I think that that kind of sparks our fear, um, especially in the workplace, the fear of getting in trouble, the fear of getting laid off, the fear of getting fired. Um, because that's getting kicked out of your tribe. And if you don't have a paycheck, it's hard to provide shelter and food for yourself or yourself and whoever um, you consider the family that lives with you. And so I think that that's kind of, you know, the basis of all of that. And um, what we're all in fear of is really um, survival at, at its most basic level. Uh, Nick Stogerberg from Black Swan Real Estate says that human every conversation is a lobby for one of three things, safety, connection and control yeah. and that's it all if you can just understand that every conversation is from that space you can help you navigate fear but i also say i think we come by our fear honestly like if mm -hmm. i mean if i had a penny for every entrepreneur that kind of came across my you know my desk shall we say we had a conversation so few of them are actually embracing entrepreneurship because they have a problem to solve or a, a disruption for the industry, or they've got something that they're doing uniquely. Most people are running away from bad bosses, running away from shitty corporate environments like that. This is an opportunity, I think, to really kind of, you know, give the finger to the old style of re leadership that you're so, you know, you're so effective at fixing like, why was fear-based leadership so prevalent and it just kind of gave us all PTSD? And now you have to be out here disrupting, saying, lead with curiosity, build a, you know, a high-performing team when that should have been obvious since day one. How did this situation happen for us yeah. here in modern-day America? Yeah. So most of the leadership techniques that we've been taught and it's been passed down through generation through generation um, were based in really the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it was everyone did the same job and you got promoted to the supervisor because you were the best at doing that one job as a worker um, employee. But really, at that point, a worker you um, didn't have access to information. So it was really easy again, go back to those three things, right? Control. It was very easy for an organization to control a workforce because people didn't have access to information. And so whatever they were told was something they had to believe to be true. Um, and, you know, owners or bosses, leaders, many of them got really good at selling whatever story was true. And, um, as time moved on, people, and again, back then, there was only a very limited to how many jobs you could have. And today's world, you know, you, if you can think of a job, you can make money do it. There are infamous ways to make a dollar in today's world. There's also more information than any of us need, right? So we can verify, we can make our own decisions. And so leading in a way with high control, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm the boss, you're not, which worked in a factory situation, 
with what people had access to and based on their own limited um, ability to you know, do something else because of the jobs that were available. You fast forward that in today's world where people have the ability to do whatever they want. They have the ability to get the information. You have to, you know, you have to be truth telling. You have to do all this stuff because we have access to information. So we can't lead in that controlling way we used to lead. We also didn't know anything about the brain back then. And now we do. And so there's so much around language and fear that we now know. And we know like just a little drop in the bucket of what I know we're going to know over the next 50 years about the brain and how to work with it. Um, but that evolution of how we live has to change how we work and, you know, running away from bad bosses. I have so many people say, you know, no one wants to work anymore. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that's not true. People want to work. They don't want to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot of versions of that. They don't want to work for blank, blank and blank. But that's the most <laughs> hits you where you live <laughs> articulation yep. of it. Nope. They don't want to work true. for you. They don't want to work for you. And that's the thing is that because you can go to companies and they're like, oh, there's a problem hiring great people. I have a huge company full of great people. And they're like confused by that because people want to work for them. But, you know, there are endless ways. So if you don't create something that is a two way street, something that is fun for both people, then they're going to go and do something else. You know, they're going to go out and, you know, find their own path. And it goes back to our very early conversation where I am as excited, if not more excited about your individual successes on this team, because I know the more successful you are, the more successful 304 and the work we do as a collective group will be where, you know, 30 years ago, I might have been jealous or I might have been like, well, why are you spending your time there? You're giving them all their your good ideas. You're like, I might have felt different about that if I had been, you know, a viewpoint of, you know, something 30, 50 years ago, um, where in today's world, I have the opportunity to celebrate everyone and know that when you're creative somewhere else, you're creative when we work together. And we experienced this during our weekly touch base this week. You had created something that you recognized was really something better for my brand versus someone else's brand. But you got to something that you worked on for me through your creativity through someone else. And that's what we want. We want ideas to come from all angles and to sub yeah, celebrate and that. It's and a hot topic. You're, it's yeah. outside. It's outside of what we normally write about. It is mm -hmm. different in a way. Um, yeah. So if you're on the mailing list, I encourage you to, because you'll get yeah. the chance to see that piece. We're doing All this. right. So, I know. So if we're, if our mantra is fuck fear and the mm -hmm. old style of leadership fear based does not work for all the reasons, even just the external chaos of how the world is a completely different place every, you know, 20 seconds, yeah. what do we do about it? How do we fix leadership? How do we fix leadership. Well, that's a, a long answer. And I think what we first do, at the, what you can do today is start working on your own fear. The more I work on myself and the more I work on my fear, the better I lead without fear. But a fear, a, a leader who is rooted in fear can never lead a fearless team. They just can't. Um, because everything is going to be based in fear. So I think that's really where it all starts is recognizing our own fear, um, where it comes up. How does it show up? You know, fear shows up in strange ways. Ooh, tell us how it shows up in perfectionism. Ooh. The topic of episode one of your podcast. That's yeah. what perfectionism, I is a, perfectionism is a tool of fear. Yeah. People pleasing all of that is a tool of fear because if I am perfect, then I cannot fail. Exactly. And so this need to be perfect constantly is this fear of getting in trouble. And I, girl, I, that was my, that was, I wore that as a badge of honor. Everything in my life had to be perfect all of the time. Um, and because that's how I, I knew I was never going to get in trouble that way. And it made it, made me a great employee. People loved work, like loved me on their team because I did 10 times more work. I made sure it was right. I would stay up all night rereading one email instead of sleeping because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, and so it made me a great employee. I was rewarded for it. I was rewarded for my fear and which created more because now that I didn't let someone down, can't let them down on Tuesday, then I certainly can't let them down on Wednesday, nor Thursday or next month. And so yeah. I was rewarded for my fear often. And we reward people for their fear all of the time. 
Well, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and you're inspiring me. And you're inspiring me. What's the one, what are you looking forward to? We're coming almost to the end of our time. What's the one, what are you looking forward to in your business? What's coming up for you that's exciting? Oh, we are doing, um, later this month, um, we're launching a leadership program for high um, performing executives. Um, actually, all of the executives for a very large organization who is about to hit massive growth. And they're going to be doing some really big things. And these are my ideal clients because they're getting in front of it. They know if they don't invest in all of their directors and vice presidents today, they're not going to have the resilience to handle what's coming for them and the growth that's coming for them. And if they can't handle it, we got bigger problems. And so this month we kick off a 15 month program to help um, all of their directors and VPs um, work on the mindset of being a leader. And yeah, we'll work on leadership techniques and tools, but we're really going to work on is adult development models, really maturing our thoughts, managing our fear and staying in this place where we can handle the, the challenges of a fast growing organization. So yeah, so we're starting that in two weeks. So I'm super excited. You know, what's so cool about your work with your clients, I just realized is that, you know, that old expression, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And like, you're always part of the solution before it ever becomes a problem. Which I think is very, which I think is very cool. I hadn't thought of it that way. I like that. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. We're punching up. We're punching up. JT, what's one question I should have asked you but didn't? Oh, good. Right. That's a good question about a question. Um, let's see. Um, how to keep your team innovative once you've managed fear. Oh, we'll have to save that for our next episode, unless you have a, unless you have a thirty-second download on it. Uh, my thirty-second download is don't over direct and don't give too many directions because what people come back with is probably better than the idea that you had in the first place. I just saw v Gary V speak to this actually. Mm -hmm. Really got me in the feels, which mm -hmm. is when you spend so much time as a boss trying to prevent client disappointment. What you miss is an opportunity where things go wrong that you can show your character and just say to the client, this is wrong. I'm sorry. I'll fix it because that builds more trust than never making a mistake. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah good one. Good one. Where can people find you, JT? 304coaching.com. Absolutely. And what? on LinkedIn and on our podcast, Let's Fix Leadership. Exactly, which is fire, y'all. There's we we say, JT says a quiet part out loud, and I've learned so much every single episode. So I highly encourage folks to go and listen to that, and join the mailing list, and follow all the things that JT does on LinkedIn and otherwise, because she is a person of tremendous influence in my life professionally as well as personally. And it's been such a fucking honor to be a part of all of this. So I thank you for your time here today, but also for the last, you know, two years of collaboration and showing me how it's done. Well, thank you. We are all here because we're together. <laughs> we are all here because we're together. And thanks for everybody who was rocking it out in the comments. Loving this up. Let's fix leadership. Thank you to Tony. Thank you for Jill. Thank you to Zach. Anybody on LinkedIn who showed up, please don't stop the conversation because the comments are still alive and well. And we and Saturn, intergalactic intern for producing another kick-ass episode of Stone Fruit Roll Up every Thursday on LinkedIn and on YouTube, the show where <laughs> You're watching the show about building the show you're watching right now. JT, thanks for giving us such an awesome Disruptor episode. I just adore you. Absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye, everybody.